Today we're going to walk you through the install of your AGM Can-Am X3 extended range tank. We're going to start with removal up here at the front corner above the fuel tank, then inside to the seat, and finally underneath to remove skids. After that, we'll get into installation. Let's get started. To start up here at the dash, we're going to need a T27 Torx, a panel popper, screwdriver, or other pick. We'll begin by removing the hardware here at the top of the dash. Pulling out the two pop rivets here. Obviously while you're doing this, it's important to use some kind of tray or catch for all your parts so you don't lose them. Simple one that's already on the car. If you don't have a mag tray, it's just to flip the center of the dash over, place all your parts there. With those items removed, we're gonna move over to the side where the filler is. Remove the side trim over the filler. Here you'll take your T27 Torx again and a 10 millimeter socket to pull this bolt off. Always a good idea to keep the nuts and the bolts together so that you don't lose anything. And there's one last T27 Torx right here at the corner of the dash. With those seven items removed, you can actually pull the corner of the dash out Important here is just to make sure that your clips are still in the panel as well as the three here in the dash. You don't want to lose those. Those are all really important for when we go back together. Now we want to remove these two hose clamps. For that, you'll need a seven millimeter nut driver. There may be some variation from car to car. Uh, so keep that in mind. Here, both are loose. You don't need to remove them entirely. Just loosen them up, up enough so that we can actually take this hose off of the fuel tank. With the clamps loose, now we can remove the fuel filler. To do that, use a large pair of channel locks or a strap wrench to break the nut loose. And then as you spin that off, you're gonna notice it runs into the hose. To get that the rest of the way off, you're actually gonna start pulling the fuel filler out as you loosen. With the fuel filler out, make sure to put the nut back on. That way you have the two in the same spot. And one thing to notice, if you can see it here, is there's actually little tabs on either side of the fuel filler. These index into the panel here. That's important to remember as you're going back together because you want those to lock in place. Those are actually what's gonna help hold this thing as you tighten the nut down. With the filler out, now you can begin taking off the hose. Here we can wiggle the hose off. If we're having issues kind of like this one is, you can use a screwdriver uh, or a hose pick and lift on the bottom of the hose to help you remove it from the tank. With the hose out, one thing you wanna do is make sure there's that this sleeve that sits inside the tank is actually pushed all the way down like you see here. If yours is not sitting like this, make sure to press this down all the way. And the reason we're doing this is later on when we install the new hose with the spray nozzle in it, it's gonna sit up against this surface. And in order for everything to fit correctly, you wanna make sure this is down. So with that in place, now we'll take a rag, stick it in the hole so that we know nothing is going to fall in uh, until we get back to the assembly section. Now let's move on. With the items up on the dash now removed, we're gonna head on to the seat. To start here, we wanna remove the two bolts at the front of the seat. Those are both 13 millimeters. With that hardware removed, we wanna slide the seat forward so that we can access the hardware at the back, as well as the seat belt nuts. With the seat slid forward, now we can access the hardware for the seat belts. Now, on the two seat models, we don't really have to worry about this. It doesn't exist. You can actually just push past here to get to the 18 millimeter nuts on each one of the seat belt adjusters. But for the four seats, we need to remove the hardware here. Uh, those are all T20 torques, so we're gonna do that now. That loosened, we can take the cover off. Set that out of the way, and we have access to our 18 millimeter nuts on both seat belts. 
Again, we're leaving the nuts with the seat belts just to make it real simple when going back together. With those loose, we can move to the hardware at the back of the seat. Now we remove the two 18 millimeter nuts at the rear of the seat bracket. And you'll see now the seat is loose. We can pull the seat out and continue with disassembly at the center console. Now we want to pull the trim off the center console. On the two seat models, there's actually a relief cut here for the wiring harness. Uh, for those, you can just reach in and grab and pull this panel out. Four seat model's a little bit different. We're actually gonna pull the rear trim back enough that we can get in and grab this front trim piece. Then you're gonna pop this back along the top edge and lift the panel out. Next, we're gonna remove the trim panels on the side of the console here so that we're able to route the harness from the switch down along and to the power distribution block or bus bar here. Uh, pretty simple deal. Again, we're just popping panels out, sliding them out of the way. Now, this particular vehicle has an aftermarket center console, but it's not much different in the factory unit. You're just popping the panels out of their clips and removing the plastic rivets, similar to what you see on the top of the dash. With that out of the way, we have access to everything that we need and we can move on to the next step. If you're installing the tank on a four seat chassis, you'll need to loosen the carrier bearing bolts located here behind these coolant pipes. There's no need to remove the bolts entirely. Just loosen them with a 15 millimeter socket enough that we are able to get the spacers installed under the carrier bearing support during assembly. The driver's side carrier bearing support bolt can be accessed without removing any trim panels as seen here. And again, all you need to do is loosen the bolt. Do not remove it. Now we move under the vehicle to remove the skid pans. If you have a two seat model, you're gonna to wanna to remove the front and rear skid pans. If you have a four seat model, you're gonna remove the front and middle skid pan. Unless you're upgrading to hardware and the AGM skid pan washers, in which case you're gonna remove all three skid pans. Now, we've already gone ahead and taken the skid pans off of the underside of the vehicle because it's a little hard to demonstrate what we're about to talk about there. Instead, we're gonna show you here what you need to pay attention to when removing the skids. Now there are two ways to remove all the factory rivets from the skid pans. The first is with an air hammer. This is a much faster method and a lot easier on your body. Uh, but if you don't have an air hammer, just a sharp chisel will work. What you wanna do in either case is take the chisel, place it on the edge of the rivet that you're gonna be knocking off. And you'll actually start hammering down at a slight angle and this is to lift the edge of the rivet. With each successive hit of the hammer, you actually wanna to begin to lower the chisel so it becomes closer to parallel to the skid pan. With your last couple punches being as near to parallel as possible. And the reason for this is now you're taking the force and instead of directing it down into the skid pan, you've turned it and you're directing it across the rivet to create a shearing force to pop the head of the rivet off. With that popped off, you'll notice that there is a small amount of the rivet that is still sitting in the chassis. That can either be pushed into the chassis, or if it's easy enough, you can grab that with a pair of dikes and pry that out. Either way is perfectly fine. With the skid pans out of the way, the last thing for the removal process is actually to trim the driver's side panel. You can do this one of two ways. If you prefer, you can take it out of the vehicle and cut it on the bench or you can do it here in the car like we're going to. To begin our installation, take the four straps and hose clamps out of the kit. We're gonna install those on the chassis. Refer to the instructions for the specific locations for your vehicle, whether it be two seat or four seat. Again, to tighten the hose clamps is a seven millimeter nut driver, just like we used up on the fuel filler neck. For here, you wanna position the hose clamp so that you have access to it from the rear. Very important that it's done this way so it doesn't interfere with the tank when everything is installed. And you're gonna to wanna to tighten this down 
to get rid of all the free play, but not so much that you can't move the strap around. Something like that will be just fine. Next, we're gonna to wanna to use a set of jack stands, blocks, or any other items that will help us hold the tank up in position and allow us to free our hands up so that we can bring the straps around and put them in place. Coming from the front of the vehicle, you wanna bring the tank with you and slide that into place. Once in place, Position the support. So that you're able to free your hands up and begin moving the straps up into position. Sometimes repositioning your supports can help as you move all the straps into position. If working on a four seat car, install the carrier bearing spacers now and be sure to align them with the bracket as seen here. Now we're gonna use the bar clamps you find in your kit to clamp the tank straps to this front seat tube. The way these work, this lower strap, the one that has the tab here is actually gonna sit underneath this seat tube here. The top one is then gonna come over it indexing on that tab and locking in place. The bolt that is on your seat strap will pass through here, install your hardware there, and this is what's gonna hold the front of the tank. This installs here, this guy over the top. And what you'll notice with some of these is there may be a small gap here, not a big deal. If you cannot get the tank strap to pass through both of these, Sometimes what can be done is just squeezing this down with a set of vice grips. We'll bring the two tabs closer together and then you should be able to pass the hardware in the tank strap through the hole. So let's install those now. That goes on the bottom. This guy on the top. And what you'll notice is there's actually a gap here. These two haven't come in contact with each other. And the reason for that is we wanna put this rubber in compression that way, when everything is clamped together, this is secured in place and it's not gonna wiggle loose. So from here, we just wanna make sure the top of the strap is parallel to the ground or flat. Let's align our holes and we can clamp this in place with a set of vice grips or any other tool that you have to do that. Now you can see the hole is aligned here. Now take the strap and push it up through the hole install the washer and nut supplied in the kit then using an 11 millimeter socket or 7 16 you want to take that down until most of the play is out do not tighten these yet though we want to install all four straps and then position the tank in center left to right before tightening the hardware. With both straps installed on the driver's side but not quite tightened, the last thing that we need to do over here before moving is cut the zip tie on the balance tube and feed the balance tube through the back of the seat and over to the center console where we can route it from the other side. A quick note on hose routing while we're still on the driver's side. For the two seat models, we're gonna cut or trim a small chamfer in the back of the panels. This is gonna allow the balance tube to pass through the center console to the other side. On the four seat models, you can actually use the cavity that's presented here as a way for routing the balance tube to the passenger side. So go ahead and feed that through here. Later, we'll come back through and zip tie all this stuff in place, but for now, that's good. Go ahead and repeat the process for the passenger side. Now we continue the process on the passenger side. Tap with the tongue here, goes underneath. Other one engages and over the top. And again, we wanna position this so that the top of the clamps are parallel to the ground or horizontal.
Now, before we tighten the hardware on all four of the tank straps, what we wanna make sure to do here is center the tank from left to right. As you can see, the gap here is just under a quarter inch. We want about the same on both sides. So a couple quick taps, puts this thing on center. Make sure to double check the two sides. Once you're on center, we can go ahead and tighten the four 11 millimeter or 7 16 nuts that are holding the tank straps in place, as well as the carrier bearing center support bolts. Okay, those four are tight. One quick note, the bar clamps may not come into physical contact with the strap. That's okay, there are some variations between chassis. You just wanna make sure that you are evenly tight on both sides. Another quick thing to make sure that you don't do is if you fully tighten these two on this side, you can actually pivot the tank down to where that side will be hanging lower in the chassis than this side. So as you're tightening, kind of work your way back and forth so you suck the tank up evenly. Okay, tank's installed, time to move on to the next step. Next, we're gonna install the pump. Go ahead and set that on the pump bracket. Hand tighten the tube nut. And here it's actually easiest if we take the hardware for the pump and install the nut underneath first. We're gonna look for it down through the hole. Once we see it, we'll take the bolt from the top side and thread it into the nut that we're holding in position. This way we're able to get it started by hand. With that in place, we can take an 11 mil or a 7 16 wrench underneath, 11 mil or 7 16 socket on top, and tighten that down. With that installed, take an 11 16 wrench and be sure to tighten the hardline nut. Now, this hardline is adjustable if for whatever reason you need to do something, but know that this is set from the factory at the height it needs to be able to pick up uh, the full volume of fuel in here. So with that installed, the last thing you wanna do is make sure to open the ball valve. In operation, this is gonna allow the fuel to flow from the transfer tank up into your stock tank. Next, you're gonna install the supplied filler with AGM nozzle, return, and supply hoses. To begin, Feed these outside of the chassis tube just beyond the fuel tank and down towards the floor of the vehicle. You can actually guide these as you go down by pulling back on the side panel. That'll give you enough room to see and help feed them down to the underside of the vehicle. And again, you can guide the hose down the side panel and underneath to the bottom of the vehicle here, which will then be fed back. For those that do not want to do this or would prefer to see what they are doing, you can also remove the side panel entirely, um, but this seems to work just fine. So now that these are both out here, we're gonna go back to the top, finish the install up there, and then we'll come back. Quick note, when installing, you wanna make sure that you can see the AGM logo pointing up towards you or out the filler neck. You do not want the nozzle pointing out towards you. This is what's gonna be spraying the fuel into the tank. So make sure that that is facing down when installing. So now let's put a hose clamp on the bottom. Position this in place. Hose clamp on the top. Now we can install the filler neck again. Go ahead and take that nut off. You're gonna to wanna to slide this into the gap first and then install the filler. As you put that together, twist the filler so that the nut is beginning to thread on to it. This is the part we talked about earlier where as we tighten down, we wanna make sure those two keyways are lining up with the panel so that when we begin to tighten this in place, the filler is held secure. With that installed and tight, tighten both hose clamps.
Now do not install the panels yet. This is as far as we want to go because once we finish the rest installation, we're going to do a leak check and we want to make sure that everything is working good up here so we don't have to do this twice. Now go ahead and take the hoses that you fed under the vehicle and pass them back through the channel that's created here under the door sill, above the lower rails and below this seat tube. It can be a little confusing, but if you just check it out, it's not that difficult. We're pulling it through this cavity here. This is the larger of the two hoses. You can see that by the markings, it's a 3 8 hose. This guy is gonna run back and feed to our vent there. Go ahead and run the second of the two hoses, which is our 5 16 that's our smaller hose. That is gonna connect to the barbed fitting on the pump. Um, a little bit of dry lube, uh, Windex, or any other temporary lubricant that is eventually going to evaporate will help you slide that on, uh, make that much easier. So with that now connected, we'll come back to the vent here. All of these are left slightly long so that you can adapt them to your specific routing requirements. In this case, you can see we have a few extra inches and that's even as we've routed this correctly around the backside of the studs and behind the wheel pad. So we'll go ahead and cut that extra inch or two off and then we'll slide this on place to the barbed fitting that is closest to the pump. With that done, now we're gonna take the balance tube from the driver's side, route that down to where we'll be making our cutout, pass it along, and again, if you have a little bit of extra, you can go ahead and cut that off and install that hose. Next, we're gonna be installing the wiring harness and switch. You can do that here either at the center console or up here on the dash. A lot of people like the dash because there's knockouts and it's a little bit easier to see from the driver's seat. So that's where we're gonna go. We're gonna start by running the entire harness through the knockout down behind the back panel of the dash. And what that's gonna do is allow it to drop out down here. And then we can run along all these other harnesses to the distribution block or bus uh, where we're gonna pick up our power. So one quick tip before you start, the few leads that are kind of floating in the middle of the harness, either a wrap of electrical tape or one of the zip ties from the kit works great to hold those in place. That way they don't get caught as you're feeding them down through the hole. So we'll start here. Go ahead and reach in from the backside and help guide those wires. behind this panel. Then we're gonna drop that down. And retrieve it from underneath where the other harnesses are coming out. Just kind of feel that as you go. Push that switch into place. And run the harness down along the side of all the others. Behind any aftermarket accessories, so you're keeping it tight to the factory harness. And now we are going to install these eyelets onto the distribution block. Before we start connecting everything, make sure that you removed the five amp circuit from the system so that the leads are not hot. We don't have any potential spark issues.
When connecting the power lead, you have two options, and it really depends on when you want to be able to use your pump or in what situation. So if you would like to be able to use your pump at all times, key on, key off, connect here to the main power. If you want more of a safety feature where this can't be left on while the car's parked somewhere and somebody bumps it, I'd suggest connecting to the accessory power. This is only going to run when the, when the key has been turned on. Um, so for this vehicle, we're going to connect to here, but now you know the two options. With those connected, we're gonna go ahead and run our harness out and around to our pump. Here at the pump, you'll notice that the power and ground are opposite style connectors. This way you don't have to worry about accidentally reversing polarity. So let's connect those here. Now, even though these connectors are insulated, it's never a bad idea to put a wrap of tape around this before you stow away just for an added layer of protection. I always like to put a little ear on the end of the electrical tape whenever we're doing stuff, just in case you do need to get that apart again. Makes that a little bit easier. Go ahead and tuck that guy down and away here. Now we can install our fuse and do a quick dry run function test. As we're doing this function test, we're gonna check two things. One, to make sure we are on the correct power port You'll know that because the switch should not work when the vehicle is off. Go ahead and engage the ignition to turn it on once. We'll try that again. And we can hear the pump is running. So we know that we are good with our electrical. Now we're gonna put some fuel in the tank, check all our connections for leaks, and also make sure that it is coming out of the nozzle into the stock tank as intended. Now here, you don't need to fill the tank until it's completely full. Just three to five gallons will get you what you need. All these tanks prior to shipping are pressure tested to make sure the tank itself is sealing. What we're looking for here is to make sure that we don't have any leaks at any of the fittings or connection points from the tank up to the factory system. With fuel in the tank, now we can perform our test. I'm gonna go ahead and flip that switch, but before I do, Take note, the sound of the pump when there's no fuel in it uh, is quite a bit louder and more noticeable than when it does have fuel pumping. This is gonna be an indication later when you're driving uh, when your auxiliary tank has run dry uh, to let you know to kick the switch off. So that note aside, let's go ahead and turn it on now. Okay, so no leaks here. We're gonna go ahead and continue up to the fuel filler. Make sure we don't have any leaks up there. We're gonna go ahead and check at the top now. Okay. No leaks up there either. And the way that you can know that you have fuel coming up to this point is actually take the filler cap off and look down the nozzle as you're doing your leak check. You'll be able to see fuel spraying out of the injection nozzle. Now that we know everything is functioning properly and there are no leaks, we can begin to seal it up. We'll start by securing the wiring harness to the factory harness. We'll come out to the pump and do the same thing here. You'll notice there's a tab on the side of the pump that is not being used for anything. We're actually gonna run a zip tie through that set the drain hose and the harness on top of that. Use that as a location to secure those in place and then continue along the drain hose, securing the harness in place. We actually wanna route this so it's on the forward face of the drain hose. That way it's further away from any rear occupants and chances that we could possibly damage it. Now we're gonna go ahead and trim up all the zip ties we've installed and make one small alteration to the side panel where the balance hose passes through. 
and put the interior back together. What we need to do is just here in the radius is actually open up this section of the panel large enough that we can fit the balance hose and the harness through. You can do that with a Dremel, uh, with a carbide bit, with a pair of tin snips, uh, whichever way you choose to do it, just make sure when you're done that the edges are nice and smooth so that we don't cut into that balance hose. Now on the two seat models, you won't need to trim this much back because you're at the rear of the vehicle here and there actually is an opening for the harness that comes through already. That'll just require a little bit of trimming, but in the four seat, because the rear panel overlaps this front panel, you'll actually need to trim in quite a bit. As you can see here, if you follow this line, We've gone in about an inch in distance and we're a little bit larger than the hole diameter. This is about a seven eighths hole. Doesn't need to be exact. Again, we just wanna make sure there's enough clearance so that when we install everything that this panel is not chafing on the wiring harness or the hose. With those in place, make sure to get the harness into a good position where it's not gonna chafe and let's put our last zip ties in and trim those up. Now you notice we haven't zip tied either one of the hoses in place at the rear of the seat. And the reason for that is we actually wanna put the seat in first and then secure them around that. So at this point, just make sure they're back and out of the way so when you install the seat, you don't pinch them. Okay, now we just continue the install in the reverse order that we took things out. Here we're putting both seat nuts back in. Now, before we move on, this is where we're gonna zip tie everything in place. If you don't move your seats forward and back, they stay in one position at all times. You wanna secure this such that you have a continuous upwards angle on your hoses. This is gonna be the ideal situation. If though you run your seat in multiple different positions, lots of people riding with you or whatever, then you're gonna to wanna to actually move these down and zip tie them to the uprights or the rear studs at the seat. That way when the seat's being moved back and forth, it doesn't come in contact with either of these hoses. Now this particular customer gives a lot of rides. So we're actually gonna secure this down in the lower position. To do that, we're gonna make a zip tie standoff. Uh, if you've never done that before, we actually have another video that talks about that specifically. I'd recommend you go check that out if there's any questions about the zip tie standoff. As always, cut the extra leads off of the zip ties installed. Now with all this secure, we can move on to reinstalling the seat belts and the front seat hardware. I don't know if you saw there, but it's important to actually hold these seat belt adjusters up. And that's because there is a key or a tab in here that locates them in this bracket. If you don't do that, there's a chance you can actually bend this little tab uh, and that will make it much harder for this to align and install in place. With those installed, let's go ahead and put the rear knee guard back over the top of the belts. We're gonna tighten that down again with that T20 Torx that we used earlier. With that stuff now installed, we can go ahead and slide our seat back and install the hardware at the front of the seat. Next, let's put the dash back together. First, let's put the main trim panel back in. And here, as you install this, just make sure that you can see the center of each one of these clips through the holes here. Same thing with the speed clips. You wanna be able to see them through here. That way, you're not having any issues with alignment. If you do not, go ahead and make the adjustments and then reinstall Now, if you're having issues putting these clips in like I am, one of the things you can do is actually lift the glove box lid up, pop that out, and then with a screwdriver or a pick, 
reach in underneath the panel and pry up on it, that's gonna give you a little more support as you put that clip back in. Important here is not to over tighten these torques. The clips that they're secured into are not very strong. So if you are using an electric tool like this, just make sure the clutch is set fairly low. Uh, if you're using a hand tool, be sure not to over torque. For anybody that's still concerned, uh, it's always best to refer to the manufacturer specs when tightening anything. So uh, that goes for not only this hardware, but everything else throughout this job. If there is any question, always refer back to the manufacturer specs for tightening. Now with all this installed, we can get this side cover on, then go underneath, finish tightening the hose clamps on the tank straps, get the skid pans installed, and we are done with this install. Back underneath the vehicle, we wanna go ahead and tighten all the hose clamps on the tank straps before we put the skid pan on. So let's bump these up into position so there's high up as we can go. Go ahead and work down the line here. Now the one thing to note, and you can see it here, is if you just rotate these clamps back without loosening them enough, they're actually gonna run into the edge of the strap. And when tightening it, what that's gonna do is allow the extra portion of this hose clamp to now then be below the center line here. So when you go to put your skid pan back on, it's actually gonna interfere. So make sure this doesn't happen. And the reason or the way you can do that is loosen this up a little bit more than you normally would while you're rotating it. That way, as you move backwards, it goes on top of the strap and then re-tighten. What this is gonna do is allow you to tighten in position so that the head of the hose clamp is actually sitting on the strap itself and the extra length of hose clamp does not come down and interfere with where the skid pan's gonna mount. Make sure you do this to all four hose clamps and you're ready for your next step. And that's it, you're done. Now go enjoy the extra mileage you've gained. Thank you.